the 16th canto of Dante's Paradiso, resumes the conversation between Dante and his great-great-grandfather, Cacciaguida. It contrasts the sober, modest, and peaceful Florence of Cacciaguida's day with the decadent and politically divided city that Dante knows. It resumes many of the ideas previously developed in the speeches of the Emperor Justinian in the sixth canto and of Charles Martel in the eighth. Moreover, in endeavoring to understand the origins of the Guelph versus Ghibelline conflict in Florence, it is the culmination of discussions stretching all the way back to Dante's exchanges with Chiaco in the sixth canto of Inferno and with Farinata in the tenth. It is therefore a highly significant canto because it brings together ideas which have been brewing throughout the entirety of the Divine Comedy. However, it can also be an extremely difficult canto to read. At times, it feels like a litany of place and family names, whose significance to the larger themes of this work is not immediately apparent. It can also be tempting to wonder whether it is simply a relic of Dante's 14th century context, better read quickly or even skipped altogether. Many works of great literature include passages like this. One thinks, for example, of the infamous 400-line catalogue of Greek and Trojan ships found in the second book of Homer's Iliad. Nevertheless, this canto is well worth attending to, and I want to illustrate this by way of an analogy. Think of the genealogies of Jesus, found in the first chapter of Matthew and the third chapter of Luke. If you don't know anything about the individuals mentioned, these verses can seem monotonous. However, once you know the stories of people like Rahab and Ruth, their presence speaks volume about the genealogy of the Messiah. Similarly, even a little background on the figures mentioned in this canto can bring it to life. To help readers understand this difficult canto, it's useful to ask two interrelated questions. First, who does Cacciaguida blame for the transformation of Florence since his lifetime? Second, what does he reveal about the origins of the Guelph versus Ghibelline conflict in Florence? In Dante's day, Florence was changing rapidly. It was a prosperous, cosmopolitan city whose wealth was built largely on an expanding textile trade of wool and silk. This flourishing trade led to a boom in population as immigrants from the surrounding countryside took up residence in the city in order to work in this industry. Prushan notes that in order to accommodate this increase in the population, the city walls of Florence had to be expanded and rebuilt twice during the 13th century, first in 1254 and once again between 1284 and 1346. She also notes that this second expansion, which took place mostly during Dante's lifetime, enclosed an area almost six times that of the previous walls of just a generation earlier. The earliest image that we have of Florence, a 14th century fresco, depicts buildings tightly packed together where work, leisure, politics, and worship happened in close proximity. This is the context for Cacciaguida's lament about how Florence has changed since his lifetime in the first half of the 12th century. His complaints reprise those of the 16th canto of the Inferno, which speaks of outsiders and their sudden wash of wealth begetting in Florence arrogance and excess. Here in the 16th canto of Paradiso, Cacciaguida mourns danger from populations mixed into one. However, his diagnosis of the social ills plaguing Florence contains none of the xenophobic or class-based prejudice we might expect. Instead of complaining about the influx of unskilled wool workers flooding into Florence, he decries the impact of elite families from the countryside in reshaping his beloved city. His targets are illustrious families like the Cerchi, who led Dante's former faction, the White Guelphs, or the Buondelmonti, who played an integral role in starting the Guelph versus Ghibelline division of Florence. Cacciaguida therefore laments the irrevocable transformation of his home, 
without scapegoating the powerless. From the very outset of this canto, there are textual clues that its conversation will not only mourn the current state of Florence, but also illuminate the Guelph versus Ghibelline conflict, which has been a constant feature of the Divine Comedy. For example, Dante's opening question to his ancestor, who were your elders, echoes the disdainful inquiry of the Florentine Ghibelline leader Farnata back in the 10th canto of Inferno, who were your family? Moreover, as we have seen in previous encounters with Justinian and Charles Martel, Dante's vision of paradise is not a place where one leaves earthly politics behind, but rather where these imperfect politics are explained. Thus, we can anticipate an explanation for this conflict and the endemic factionalism to which it gave rise. This explanation comes in the form of an origin story. Starting on line 136, Cacciaguida mourns, the house that bore your tears, begotten by a righteous indignation. Putting an end to your happy life was honored with your kin. O Buandel Monte, what ruin did you bring us when you fled their wedding for the sweet kiss of another? Many would still know joy, who now are sad, if that first day you approached the town, God had been gracious to the Emma, had granted that in its waters you should drown. Fitting that Florence should in her last peace should slay a victim on the broken stone relic of Mars that guards the bridge. This dense yet powerful passage leaves readers with many questions. What is the house to which Dante refers? Why were they righteously indignant? Who was Juan del Monte? What wedding did he skip for the sweet kisses of another? Finally, who was the victim slayed near the relic of Mars? To make sense of these lines, we need to know the story behind them. To do that, we need to begin with Buondelmonte. Buondelmonte di Buondelmonti was a handsome Florentine knight who lived at the beginning of the 13th century. He was promised in marriage to a young woman of the Amade family, the unnamed house in this passage. However, one day while he was out riding, he was approached by another Florentine named Eldruda Donati, who convinced him that he should not marry into the Amade family but instead should marry his beautiful daughter. Juan del Monte did as Aldruda suggested immediately, without regard for the feelings of his former fiancé's family. When they heard about this slight to their honor, the Amide were filled with righteous indignation and swore vengeance. They were advised by their ally, Mosca de Lamberti, that the only way to truly settle the matter would be for Juan del Monte to die. Thus, on the morning of Easter Sunday, 1215, the members of the Amide family attacked him near the foot of the Statue of Mars on the city side of the Ponte Vecchio, the famous bridge crossing the Arno into Florence. Buondelmonte was killed, and the resulting feud gave birth to the rival parties which became Guelphs and Ghibellines. Cacciaguida can therefore wish that Buondelmonte had died by accidental drowning in the Emma. The stream that his family would have had to cross to get from their country estate into Florence, then have been murdered as part of this revenge plot, thus sparking so much division and suffering. The importance of this origin story is that it strips this conflict of its ideological rationales. Beneath high-minded claims to support the Holy Roman Emperor or the Pope is actually a tale of hate and resulting violence. Moreover, the fact that this catalytic murder takes place at the foot of the statue of Mars, when all the participants involved should be observing the holiest day of the Christian year, perhaps even at the time that they should be in mass, signals that this kind of political division is at core the result of human sin, even a kind of bloody sacrifice to the pagan god of war. Hate begets hate and violence, violence. This story therefore finally makes sense of the destroyed and damaged souls we have encountered in Inferno, in Purgatorio. Now that the origins of Florentine factionalism have been unmasked, Dante is ready to hear about his own impending exile, itself the result of a division between the Guelph party. For this third and final portion 
of his conversation with his great-great-grandfather, however. We will have to wait for the 17th canto.